Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Living Water Community Church. My name is Rick Thompson. I'm the privileged pastor here, and I want to welcome you and welcome those who are joining online. Before I jump into the message, I just, during the whole worship portion, and even while I was sitting there, I just had this thought rolling through my head. And the, ho- the thought was, even as we talked about in the worship, that the, the, the God we serve is a miracle working God. And aside from just going through the motions of like coming to church and you know checking that church box, God wants relationship with us beyond just that. How I many you know that's true? That that He He wants to show up and He wants to blow up in your life. He wants to be an active participant in your life, and and He has the ability to do all sorts of things all sorts of creative things uh, if we will just have the faith and the expectancy that he will. Some of you are, uh, are here today and you're, you're going through a difficult time. I was sharing with some, some people or, uh, earlier today, some of our church folks, that our year has started out very difficult considering you know, the, the plan and the path that I am projecting for the church. Anybody's having a difficult time already this year? Come on, somebody. Anybody? Is it just me? You you already said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Lord, if this is how it's going to start, but I declare over you that the devil is a liar. Amen? Amen. And that the God we serve, that the greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. And, and God has the ability to give us those victories. It's a, I, I, feel, I feel a David anointing. He said, the same God who gave me the victory over the... The bear and the lion is going to give me the victory over these giants in our lives. Amen? And so that's what I'm believing. I'm believing it for ourselves, and I'm believing it for for our church. Now, we've been in the middle of a series that we've entitled 2020 Vision. Say 2020 Vision. And it's based really on two scriptures, Proverbs 19.21, that says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's, help me, purpose that prevails. It's the Lord's purpose that that prevails, and that's what we've been saying, that if you wanna, if you wanna land uh, on the first time, I mean, that should be our heart. As it relates to God, any plan, we should all want to land on God's plan for our lives first, amen? Amen? And, and Proverbs 29 tells us why. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law happy is he. And so we live in a world, we live in a, si- a society that's searching frank, uh, frantically for happiness. And they're looking for it in, in all the wrong, wrong places. They're looking for it through fame and, and, and fortune. They're looking for it through power and influence. Some are, some are into the party. They, they like the wine. They like the women. They like the drugs. But they're looking for it in all the wrong places. And so, we, so, so, so in this series, we're asking, do you, do you see a, a clear vision for your life this year? Do you see it? And as it relates to your, not just your life, but your family, your ministry, your wealth, your health, uh, are you seeing it? And we said C stands for, if you're going to see it, you're going you're gonna to search for God. He says, if you, if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with half a heart, help me somebody. What does it say? Turn to someone and say, stop giving them half your heart. Come on. All right? He says, you'll seek me and find me if you seek me with your whole heart. That's what he said. And then when he, when he starts to reveal it, sometimes our plans don't line up with his plans, does it? And so, so, so he says, I am the Lord thy God. I change not. How many of you know that God gets it right every time? Come on, somebody. He, he don't make no mistakes. He, he, he never had to come back and say, you know what, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I messed up. God, God doesn't mess up because the, the scripture literally says we see through a glass dimly, but when we see him, we'll see him face to face. We are walking by faith, but God sees perfectly clear what's going on. Amen? So, so if he reveals his plan for us and what we are doing is different than what he is saying, how many know that we need to make an adjustment? Yes. Expect to make an adjustment. Expect to make an adjustment if you, if you plan on, uh, on, on, on uh, fulfilling God's uh, will for your life. And then you need to execute it. The Bible says to, to take the vision, write it down. 
He says it, it's not those who hear God's word that are justified before him. It's those who do what he says that are justified before the Father. Amen? And, and, and if, you, if you're not going to see clearly, listen, you're going to end up, what we talked about last week, with a sad approach, S-A-D approach. Or I call it spiritual diplopia. What does diplopia mean? Somebody was paying attention. Come on, somebody. Yeah, double vision, double vision. And, and, and that means the double vision of your, of your own self-interest. That means your own agenda. Like Peter, G Jesus walks along and he tells Peter, you know, this is what's going to happen. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hand of wicked men and, and he's going to be crucified and be delivered up and all these other things. And, and Peter turns around and said, Lord, takes him aside. said, Lord, that will never happen to you. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Because you are not concerned with, with the plans that God has, but what your own plans are, or, or the plans of, of the world. And so there's two visions. And that's what Peter was actually bumping up against. He had a vision of Jesus that probably went along the same line as, as all the other apostles. They saw him as the Messiah. And they saw that he was going to come in and deliver them from the oppressions of the Romans. And so at some point, they, they were going to take their place because they got in at the ground floor uh, uh, with Jesus. And so now Jesus is talking in his mind, foolishness. What do you mean you're going to die? What do you mean you're going to be here? That's never going to happen as long as I live. And, 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 and Jesus turned around and said, no, no, no. See, how many know that if Jesus didn't fulfill his mission, all of us would be lost? Did you hear what I said? If Jesus didn't fulfill the mission, the plan, the purpose that God has established for him, we would all be lost. But here we have two visions and they both cannot be correct. Diplopia, double vision, self-interest, your own agenda. There's the double vision of accepting the lies of the world like King Ahab did, remember? When, when he, he inquired of the prophets, should I go up and take the land from the Syrians? And, and, and 400 of them said, yeah, go ahead. And only one said, go king, if you go up there, you ain't coming back. And that was the one that God had put the truth in. And, and for telling the truth, what, what did he get? A smack across the face and thrown in jail. How many know that not everybody's going to want to hear what you got to say, especially if you're speaking the truth? Hello? Now, there are people that tell me this all the time. Pastor Rick, you know, it's not what you say, it's, it's how you say it. I said, what does that mean? Well, you, you're, not, you, you're, you're not supposed to offend anybody. I said, really? I said, because Jesus would not have offended anybody. What, what? Are we reading the same Bible? I always come back with, listen, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Are we in agreement with that? He says, I, I always do what the Father tells me. Just, can anybody else say they always do what the Father tells them? I don't. I wish I could, but I don't. But he says, I always do what the Father tells me. And then the Bible tells me about God, that God is love, right? And that Jesus represents God, so he's love. So everything Jesus said, 100% of the things he said were said in love. Are we in agreement? 100% of the things he said were said in love. And they crucified him. Why? Because they liked what he said? Because the things he was saying offended them. He told his brothers, you can go up. They're not mad at you. But the things I say convict them of their sin. And for that, they didn't want to hear what Jesus had to say. And they worked out a plan to get rid of him. Everything he said was in love. Everything he said came from the Father. And they crucified him for what he said. Figure it out, guys. And so... We have a choice. We can either accept the, the, the word or we can accept the, the lies of the world. Double vision. But if you're walking around accepting two visions, three visions, four visions, what you got is blurred vision. And you are never going to see clearly what God has for you. So what do you have to do? You have to start to dissect and to let go of that which is not of the Lord. Amen? And the great place to find out what's, what's of God and what, uh, what's not of God is in the Bible. Amen? That means you might have to spend some time doing what? 
oh my goodness, and I think of great opportunity are these life groups, amen? Jump into these life groups and start to discern God's plan, God's vision, only if you want to be happy. Because the Bible says, you know, uh, 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 those who follow his vision, happiness will follow in their lives, amen? Amen. And so we don't want to accept the lies of the world. And the last one was the, of sad is divided loyalties. The Bible says a double-minded person, help me out somebody, does anyone know that one? Is unstable in all of his ways. A double-minded means of two minds or of two opinions. Anybody ever met someone? Anyone ever met someone who agrees with everything? <laughs> And the purpose, they, the reason why they agree with everything is because they don't want to offend anybody. So they say, yeah, so, so what you're doing is fine too. And then someone who's doing, going behind them, you know, that, that's fine too. And they're the ones that say all roads lead to the same place. All roads lead to heaven. Yet what they're telling him are, are exact opposite. I was in India and there's, a, there's thousands and thousands of people who are following after you know, bowing down to, to, you know, rocks and trees and birds and monkey gods and eagle gods. I promise you all roads cannot lead to the same place. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So if you stand, if you, if you stand for, I mean, if you accept everything, you stand for nothing. That's basically what's going on. If you cannot take a stand because you're afraid of offending someone, that's called the fear of people. And you will never get to where God wants you to be because you're accepting all these different visions for your life and for your family's life. James 1.8 says, their, their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are, help me somebody, unstable in everything they do. Jesus said about that person, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate the one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Amen? Amen. Where, there's, where there is two visions, there's a word for that. Division. And Jesus made it very clear. He said, a house divided cannot stand. So it's very important for us to get on what God is saying. And what God is doing, not just for our church, but for our personal lives as well. Because the devil is full of lies. He will send out all sorts of great sounding things for us to, to jump on, but it may not be gone. And your house will start to divide, and a house divided cannot stand. Do you have Matthew 6, 24 on your outline? Yes. I want you to serve, or, I mean, I want you to underline the word serve. Serve, no one could serve two masters. Because that's where we're going to go. We're going to set our 2020 vision on this morning in the hopes of recognizing clearly what God would have us focusing on at the beginning of this year and throughout the remainder of this year. Now, Jesus said something very important as he was ending his earthly ministry in Luke chapter 22. This is what he says, verse 15. Jesus says, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, the Passover meal is much like what we're, we're doing today. The, it, it was a type of shadow of what was to come. It was representative of what God was doing in the big picture of Jesus. Anybody remember the story of the Passover? Come on, somebody. Anyone remember the story? Where the Egyptians were, had the, the, the Jews enslaved, and God sent Moses and Aaron to declare to them to let my people go, but the Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and at the very last, uh, God sent a bunch of plagues, but at the very last, he says, if you don't let them go, it's going to be a problem for you. And he says, I'm going to send the death angel. Remember the death angel? That God was going to send the death angel and take out all the firstborn in the land. But he told the people, he told his own people, I want you to take, a, a, a sacrifice a lamb, dip hyssop in that lamb, that blood, and I want you to do something with it. I want you to put it on your doorpost. This is what the doorpost went, on the top and on the sides. Anybody see it? a pattern on the top 
and on the sides. Come on, somebody. What does that look like? It looks like the cross. And so the Passover, he's sitting down in front of, a, uh, in front of the communion. He says it's not, he's not going to eat it again until and he's, he's going to have to suffer, but he's not going to. He, he, um, for I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He, and he told him that when I see the blood, when I see the blood on the foreshadows, I will pass you over. When I see the blood on that house, he said, make sure you put the blood on that house. Because if I don't see the blood, the death angel is coming. But the moment I see the blood, the death angel is going to pass you over. How many know that, that Jesus is our Passover lamb? Come on, somebody. Jesus is the reason why, why you and I make it into heaven. It's not because you're good or because you can quote scripture or because I can, you know, put a message together. It's not because, you know, you've given into the offering plate or, or you gave something to the homeless man on the street. It's only because it says, by grace you've been saved through faith and this not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no man may boast. Because the Passover lamb, has, has, uh, uh, our sins have been projected onto Jesus, and, our, and we are covered by the blood of Jesus. And when he sees the blood, the, 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 what we deserve does not come on us, but it passes us over. Come on. That's good news. That's good news. So he tells us, he sits down with them. And he's talking to them and he's saying, I'm not going to eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom. Then he took a cup of wine. He gave thanks for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. And he took some bread and he gave thanks, thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the, is the new covenant between God and his people. That's you and I. An agreement confirmed, confirmed with, help me somebody, with what? With my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. But here at this table, sitting among us as a friend, is the man who will betray me. For he has been, for he has been determined, for it has been determined that the Son of Man must die but what sorrow awaits the one who betrays him? So right away, the disciples began to ask each other, well, which one of them would ever do such a thing? Which, you know, they started talking. Jesus made a powerful statement. Somebody at this table, somebody at this prophetic meal that we're about to have is going to betray me. And so right away, they start talking among themselves. Which one could it be? Which one could it be? I want you to take note of that because we're going to circle back. And so this morning... We're here before a community table, and Jesus was his last meal, and during that meal, he commanded us to do something. He commanded us to do this in remembrance of him and what he's done for every single one of us. And then John fills in the rest of that evening as far as what transpired that night. In John 13, 1, 7, uh, verse 1, it says, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come, to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his, his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. And so he got up from the table, watch this, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin, then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. And when Jesus, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, you, you are going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, a person who has been bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. And that is what was meant. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. Now, here's the crux. Pay attention. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again. He sat down and he asked, listen, listen, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I've done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you. 
for doing them. Now let's complete the, the, that evening picture or the, or, and circle back to where we left off because this is what it says. Jesus uh, told them who was going to betray them in Luke chapter 22, verse 21, remember. But here at this table, sitting among us, is a friend, and among us is a friend, is a man who will betray me, for it has been determined that that son of man must die, but what sorrow awaits the one who betrays him? And now we have this conversation, the disciples begin to, to ask, which one of them is doing this? Which one of them is doing it? Now I want you to look where the conversation quickly turns to in a, in a relative short order. All right? Which I believe is what prompted Jesus to give his example about what was going on. All right? It says, Then they began to argue among themselves about what? What? So Jesus tells them this, <laughs> this thing. All right? He gives them this ex example. Okay? And then they start to, they, they start saying, he's saying, someone's going to betray me. And the disciples start arguing about who they think, is, who, is, who do you think is going to be, who's going to be. And at the same meal, the very next thing they start talking about is who's going to be the goat among them, who's going to be the greatest. Now, how many of you know, this is a dude thing, right? Because right? ladies don't do stuff like this. The conversation ain't going to turn to who's the best one in terms of, you know, Dudes do this sort of stuff, right? Do, 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 do. <laughs> I remember with my brothers, it was always a competition with everything. If, if, we were, if we were in the pool, we had to see who, was, who could hold their breath the longest. If we, if we were in sports, we had to see who had the most trophies. If we, if we, when we started dating, we were comparing who had the prettiest girls. When, when, when we, we, were, we were in races, we were trying to figure out who was the fastest, who was the strongest when we'd wrestle, who was the, who, who, who was the smartest when we go to school. And so this is a dude thing. These guys are talking dude nonsense. <laughs> and Jesus, Jesus hears it, and he flips the script on them. Listen, Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and great men lorded over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, say among you, among me, it will be different. Those who are greatest among you, listen, should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a what? like a servant. Who is more important? The one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. For I am among you as one who does what? Serves. Who serves. And so Jesus is addressing an issue right from the word go. He's about to make his exit from this planet he tells them what's going to happen. He says there's a one who sits among us as a friend, but he's going to be the one to betray him. The natural conversation is, well, not me. Well, who's going to be? It's not going to be. It's going to be. And within a few minutes, <laughs> now they're talking about who's, who's the best one, who's the greatest among them, who's, who, who, who does Jesus love the most, who's going to win more people to him, who's going to, I don't know, lay hands on the sick. And, I don't know, whatever their competition was. And Jesus is hearing this, and he's realizing that if that competitive spirit is released into this church, a house divided will not be able to stand. You hear what I'm saying? A house divided will not be able to stand. And so he takes them aside and he flips the script on them and he says, you want to be great in my kingdom? If you want to be first in my kingdom, it, those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank and the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important than the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course. But Jesus says, but I am not here, but not, but not here, for I am among you as one who serves. Amen? And so, as we approach this table today, we have to approach it with complete clarity as to God's desire for us and Saving us. Why did God save us? Why did God do all that he did? Why did he shed his blood? Was it for us just to come and occupy a pew on Sunday morning? Come on, somebody. Was it just so that during the worship we can get Holy Ghost goosebumps and shake a little bit, speak in tongues, and, 
and, and go on about a merry way. I promise you, if you think that's all God did, that's the only reason he did it, you are missing something. You're missing something very important. So he says, I want you, he did it so that we can follow his example. Philippians 2.5 gives us his example. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal death on a cross. Therefore, someone say therefore. Therefore, Therefore, in fulfilling his mission, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the church said, so what example did Jesus give us? Does he give us an example of, hey, I'm God, and everybody should bow down and serve me? Does he buy into, you know, which one of you are the greatest? Well, I'm going to tell you which one's the greatest. You're the greatest. No, you're the greatest. No, you're the greatest. No, he says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, flip the script. He says, he says who's greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who's serving the person sitting at the table? And in this world system, it's the person who's sitting at the table getting served. But he says, yet I am here among you as one who serves. And then he took off his outer garments. And that's why Peter freaked out. And then he got a basin of water. And he went to the dirtiest place on the, on the body, which was they didn't have these nice little Nike shoes and, and whatever. They had sandals and they had dirt roads. And their feet were filthy. And he went to that filthy spot. And he humbled himself. And he put himself in a position of a servant. You know who washed the feet in the houses back then? Servants, yeah. You'd come to the house, and they'd say, you know, call for the servant person, and that servant person would come with a basin of water and wash for him. The king of kings and the lord of lords. The one who is the exact representation of God Almighty. Assume the position of a servant. And not just a servant in that moment. He humbled himself to the point Death, even death on a cross. And the Bible says because of his, God gave him a name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, someone say Jesus. Jesus. God was pleased with what God, what Jesus did. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Does depression have to bow at the name of Jesus? Does the devil have to bow at the name of Jesus? Come on, somebody. Does debt have to bow at the name of Jesus? Unforgiveness. Every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth at the name of Jesus. So a servant leader, who, who Jesus is our example, that's who he says that we should be. That's what we should be focusing on or becoming. A a servant leader does three things. I want you to write this down really quickly. A servant leader, a servant leader walks in love. Walks in love. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your, help me. Don't use your freedom to do what? To satisfy your sinful nature. God did not set you free to sin. So he said, don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to do what? To serve one another. How? To serve one another in love. To serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. (laughs) Love your neighbor as yourself. It's the law of love. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 7, 12. He says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. 
Not do to others before they do it to you or because they did it to you. Do to others what you would like for them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. The Bible calls it the golden rule. Pastor Rick, you don't understand. I'm, people are constantly misunderstanding me. If you want to be understood, be understanding of what's going on in other people's lives. If you want to be forgiven of your faults, be someone who forgives other people's faults. Come on, somebody. Jesus says offenses are coming in this world. And the way the enemy likes to mess with the church is through offense. Because you get offended, someone says something, someone did something, and rather than you giving them grace, you choose to hold on to it. And now there's a division. And the enemy ain't stupid. He said, your house is going to be easy to divide because everybody feels like they have, you know, they got rights in the way you said it and the what you said and whatever. You need to walk in forgiveness. If you want people to be patient with you, are you patient with people? If you need and want support in your times of need, are you giving support in times, of your, in times of needs of others. So a servant leader walks in love. Second thing a servant leader does is he serves the Lord, whilst this is important, <laughs> by serving other people. I, I'm serving the Lord. Where? What are you doing? Well, what do you mean? I mean, I'm a servant of the Lord. Where are you serving? Uh, I mean, I came to church. Oh, oh, okay. Let's read it. Colossians 3.23. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the pastor. Come on. Working for the children's director. Come on. Working for your boss. What does it say? Work Work willingly at whatever you do, whatever means whatever, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. And remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward. And that the master you are serving is who? Is Christ. So we serve the Lord by serving others, by doing what we do as unto the Lord. Can we, can we do what we do as unto the Lord without an attitude? I mean, if Jesus was here, would we be giving him attitudes all the time? I'll do it, but... You, you know what I'm talking about. Nobody, nobody ever gives God an attitude. No one ever gives that attitude, right? <laughs> 1 John 4, 20. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a, help me, is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. I love God, but I hate people. No, you don't. I mean, you may hate people, but you don't love God. How can you say you love God who you can't see? Anybody ever seen God? I, I haven't seen God. I've sensed the presence of God. I might have seen God expressed through other people, but I've never actually seen him. No one has actually seen him. So how can you say you love him? Let me read it again. If someone says, I love God, but hates, hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. And if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, those who love God must also love their fellow believers. So we're going to walk in love, and we're going to serve the Lord by serving others. Lastly, we're going to get involved. James 2.14 says this, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions, can that kind of faith save anyone? Should I read that again? Are you all still with me? 
What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm, eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. And someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. Some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can, how, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith. Help me, somebody. By my good deeds. Question. What are you doing as we start this year? Have you come to a place where you are basically content to check a Sunday box and say, okay, I love God, but I can't stand this person or that person, or I love God, but you're not actually serving anywhere. Are you content to do that? Or are you willing at the beginning of this year to put on your spiritual 2020 vision and say, okay, Lord, you didn't save me just to sit. You actually saved me to serve. And the way he tells us how to serve, I don't want you to serve begrudgingly. He says, I want you to serve in love. In love. I want you to speak to one another in love. I want you to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Anybody ever mess up bad? Gosh, too many times to count. When you mess up bad, how many of you love when people point out that you've messed up bad? How many of you love when people say to you, you big dummy, you blew it again? What is wrong with you? Are you some kind of idiot? How many like that? Come on, somebody. When you mess up bad, what would you rather hear? You big dummy or someone that says, yeah, you blew it, but I'm going to forgive you for it. I'm going to continue to pray for you, and I believe in you. Come on, somebody. I, I, because actually no one is perfect. Jesus says, don't judge. Don't judge. Because the same people we're pointing to, you're trying to point out a speck in someone else's eye when there's a big old log in yours. Be careful. Be careful. Because the same measure you measure it out, it's coming back the same to you. And so God calls us. He calls us to follow the example of Jesus, who is our servant leader, to walk in love, to, to, to serve the Lord by serving others, and not just to take up a comfortable pew on a Sunday morning, but to find a place where I can get involved in the lives of, uh, of, of the people around me. Again, if the answer is I'm doing nothing, I want to suggest to you that there are several opportunities in and out of the church I don't know if they gave these out when you were, came in, but I want, if they haven't, I want you to grab them. The ministry, oppor ministry opportunities, areas uh, of opportunities to serve in this church, we have some tremendous needs. And it doesn't happen just by, well, someone said it's the 80-20 rule. 20% of the church does 80% of the work. Now, you put that, Juxtapose that next to what Jesus said at his last supper meal. He said, the greatest of you is going to become servants. If you want to be great in my kingdom, stop playing this competition game about who's one up in this one, who one up in that one. He says, I've come among you to give you an example as one who serves. If service is not on your plan for this year, you're going to miss God in a big way. You're going to miss God in a big way. I have faith, but I have actions. Faith without works is dead. In fact, that same verse says, 
You say you have faith and you believe there's a God? He says the devil believes there's a God. Come, that's, not, that's not awesome. The devil believes and he trembles. And so if I've got faith in God, it should motivate me to do something for God. The reason I'm here today is because my faith in God motivated me to say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do with this life that you purchased for me, that you went to the cross for me, that you shed your blood on Calvary for me so that I might not pay the penalty for my own sins. The Bible says I've been bought with a price. And so out of gratitude, I come before God's throne room of grace and I say, Lord, what can I do to serve you? And so that's your challenge for this year. What is God asking you to do? To not just sit, but in this year, serve. Find a place. And now this is one of the things I ask you, because this is cool here at this church. Because you might say, well, Pastor Rick, I don't know what, what to do. Try something. And then if you get into it and it starts to float your boat, continue with it. But if you try it and you say, okay, this, this one isn't for me, it's okay. You can try something else. Is that all right? It, it, there's, there's no condemnation in God's kingdom. But let's, one of the songs says, let's wake up. Let's not pretend that, that what, the things that God is asking us to do is just going to happen by itself. At some point, we have to, we have to respond like the prophet. Uh, who will go for me? And someone needs to say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Because God may want to use you to reach your neighbors. God may want to use you to reach your friends or your family. And you don't see yourself as a servant leader. You're like, well, who am I? Listen, you want to know what my qualifications? Someone asked me that today. My qualifications for preaching, I look through the Bible and I see a story about Balaam's donkey. <laughs> and God spoke through a jackass. And my wife said, amen to that. Don't laugh so hard. <laughs> She's laughing in the back. If God can speak through a donkey, then certainly God can speak through me and you. So let's not get all spiritual. I don't, I don't have a degree in, in theology. I, I don't know a lot of this. I don't... I can, <laughs> What did donkey know? <laughs> you know who God is looking for? Whosoever is willing. You know, that's your, that's your qualifications. He doesn't call the qualified. Listen to me. He qualifies the call. So once you say yes, you say, oh, that's my girl. That's my guy. Now I'm going to start instilling in him because they're serious. They understand that faith without works is dead. And God has called us not just to show up and sit down. He called us to, to say, okay, Lord, I want to be a servant of yours. And the way you serve God, because you've never seen him. The way you serve God is by serving others. So if you're not in the habit of serving others, you are probably not serving God. Ta-da. 2020 vision. I hate that I have to use glasses. <laughs> but when I do put on those glasses and things come into focus, oh my goodness, that's what that says. <laughs> So now I'm not tripping over my words. 
I'm not tripping over my thoughts. What does that say? It's just a little blurry picture. It's a blur. Holy Spirit, give us spiritual 2020 vision. Help us to see things the way you want us to see things. It starts, it starts, as I always say, as a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no one that loves you more than your Father in heaven. You are not an accident. You were pre-planned from the beginning of the world. God had you on your mind, on his heart, on his mind for such a time as now. You are his, the Bible calls you his masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus, it literally says, to do good works. Anybody willing to say, Lord, here I am, use me. Now you know your qualifications. Willingness. Starts by trusting Jesus Christ for, for the salvation of your soul. If you haven't done that, that's your very first place. Acknowledging that what God did, that he became that Passover lamb. When I see the blood, the blood on the top, the blood on the sides, the blood on the sides. Jesus had a crown of thorns on his head. He was whipped and he was nailed to a cross. And the moment I put my trust in him, when God sees the blood, that death angel passes me over. Have you accepted Christ? Have you acknowledged that you need a savior, that you're a sinner, and that you need a savior? That's where it starts. That's where it starts. And in a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of commitment to him if you haven't done that. That's where it starts, but that's not where it ends. Because he did not save us to sit. He saved us so that he can express his love through us to a world that's absolutely dying and in need of spiritual clarity. Because if we don't, who will? And if we don't let it operate in our families, who will? And so at this moment, I'm going to ask everyone to close the, to bow their heads and close their eyes. And if you've not yet accepted Christ as your Savior, if you don't have the assurance that if you die today, that you would be with him, that that death angel would in fact pass you over and that you would pass from death to life if, and you would like the assurance of asking him to forgive you and to come into your life and to come into your heart. It would be my privilege to lead you in a prayer. Say something like this. Say, Heavenly Father, today I bow my heart before you, my head and my heart. And I acknowledge my need for a Savior. I thank you for being the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of God. That because you shed your blood, because you, you shed your, your body was broken and you shed your blood on the, on the cross, that death angel will pass me over. I believe that Jesus is my Messiah. Come into my life, come into my heart from this day forward. I put my trust completely in you. Fill me with your spirit. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it, just slip up your hand and say, Pastor Rick, that was me. I prayed to receive Jesus today. I see your hands. Anybody else? Anybody recommit their lives today too? I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Okay, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, take that next step. Ask him, Lord, I don't want to just sit. I want to serve you. And the way I serve you, you made it clear, is by serving others. Father, show me my place. Some of you are already in it. You're doing it. You're using the, your gifts and your abilities for God in so many different ways. But if, that's, if you haven't yet, ask him. He'll tell you. Pray about it. Pray into it. And then explore it. We need help in the children's department all day long. Those kids need someone to pour into them. They're, they're the next generation. There are other areas that we need help in. So when you get a chance, you look at that ministry application and you fill that out and you turn that in. And you say, Lord, this year, I'm gonna, I want to see you clearly. 
and I want to take my position in service to you. In Jesus' name.